Silver's Rayleigh, ladies and gentlemen, also known by his epithet. Silver's Dark King, Badass Extraordinaire, Dragon Slayer, Super Saiyan God, Blade Master Rayleigh. He is simply put one of the single strongest characters in the One Piece world, and the dude is pushing 80. Here are some fun facts that maybe you didn't know about Rayleigh. He mastered hockey at the age of three. He destroyed a mountain with just his laugh. He drank an entire island's worth of booze. He's a fan of Broadway musicals. And here's the real kicker. None of that is confirmed, but seriously, you thought it could be for a second, didn't you? Hell, I thought it might have been real, and I'm literally making them up as I go along. The time has finally arrived. Silver's Rayleigh discussion video. I'm pretty pumped for this. In fact, I'm so pumped for this, I don't think the excitement can just be contained in a single video. So for the next few days, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do, because I love y'all a lot. We're gonna be talking about some of the strongest, badass characters in the entire series. Today we're talking about Rayleigh, tomorrow let's talk about Roger, and if we're just continuing on with the R names, let's do, uh, Rob Lucci after that. Okay, that's cool, and then after that, uh, uh... R word. Rebecca! We're doing a discussion video about Rebecca! You think I'm joking? You think I'm kidding? I will do a discussion video about how awesome Rebecca is! Don't you freaking test me! Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's dial this back a bit. I was at an NFL game last night and the Steelers won, so it was like really, really a lot of excitement being pumped through the stadium. Okay, so, um... Talking about Silver's Rayleigh. Yes, of course I have the Master Sword. Rayleigh has the Master Sword. He might as well have, right? Okay, so something you gotta know about Rayleigh before we even get to talking about the character himself is his importance in the story. Alright, is it any coincidence that the Straw Hats just happen to run into the first mate of Roger's crew right as they reach the halfway point of the Grand Line? It's almost... Like it was intended that way by the author or something. Here's the thing. Up until this point, we didn't really know a lot about Roger personally. Okay, there was a, you know, a whole mythology built around Roger because he was the king of the pirates. I'm sure in every little tavern that you can go in in the One Piece world, somebody was telling some crazy story about Roger. Maybe they might have been true stories like, Hey man, remember that time Roger took out Shiki the Golden Lion? I remember that story, let's tell it again. Or maybe they might have been a little bit more mythologized, like, I heard Roger took out an entire island of giants that were as tall as the sky. You know, so there was a lot of stuff built up around Roger, but when it came to the Straw Hats actually knowing about the man personally, we didn't really get that. Um, the only other person they ran into in their journey that knew Roger personally was Crocus at the Twin Capes and Crocus didn't really bring it up to them that I was a member of Roger's crew I knew the dude personally I was his doctor he didn't know anything about that you know because they just kind of arrived at the Twin Capes helped out Crocus and Laboon got Mr. Nine and Miss Wednesday to retreat and then you know Ro Crocus was a nice enough guy he gave them the log pose and you know told Nami how to use it and how to navigate the Grand Line and Crocus also gave them a very important uh, little tidbit that probably not a lot of pirates starting out on the Grand Line knew about. They, he told them exactly where the One Piece was. He's like, yeah, there's this final island, it's called Raftal. It could be where the King of the Pirates himself hid the One Piece. Now, I think Raftal, most people probably know about it, but it's kind of a mystery whether or not it's there or not. Crocus pretty much told them directly, like, what you're looking for is on the island of Raftal. He didn't tell them how to get there or how difficult it would be, but he's like, yeah, he's in no certain terms telling him, yeah, that the, the One Piece is located on Raftal. So that's where you need to go, right? And um, after the Straw Hats sail off into the sunset from the Twin Capes, Crocus is just kind of there, you know, looking on as they're sailing away. And he's like, hmm, Roger, that's an interesting band of pirates, don't you think so? So yeah, you got to think about it from Crocus's perspective, okay? Crocus was already a lighthouse keeper there, you know, before he joined Roger's crew. But after he got back from journeying with the King of the Pirates himself, he got back to the Twin Capes, he had to sit there and watch all these newcomers come down Reverse Mountain. And you know, by and large, probably most of them, Crocus was just kind of looking at them like, these are pathetic. These people aren't going to get, you know, two islands into the Grand Line before they either die or give up. But then the Straw Hats showed up, and, you know, Luffy did everything with Laboon, and he had the same Straw Hat that Roger had, and eventually Shanks had. So you know Crocus saw something special there with Luffy, right? And so that's why he kind of helped him out there the way he did. But then, after that, we didn't get anything else. You know, the Straw Hats didn't run into Scop or Gabon or Seagull or anybody else that was on the Roger crew. I mean, yeah, you had Buggy, but... 
yeah, no. <laughs> no, not, not really too much information gotten from Buggy there. So finally, the Straw Hats arrive at the red line, the halfway point of the entire journey. Uh, now they have to figure out some way to get through the red line into the new world, right? But this was a very important part in the story. Uh, this was right around chapter 500, and it was in fact chapter 500 exactly when we got to see Rayleigh. That was a huge thing, you know, just at the very end of the chapter, all of a sudden, by the way, here's the freaking first mate of Roger's crew. Didn't expect that in this arc, did you? Well, we get that. Um, but not only that, Rayleigh later on, you know, he demonstrates his power at the auction house. He just breaks out of his bonds, uses Conqueror's Hockey to knock everybody out. And then later on, they all just meet up at the bar and Rayleigh is perfectly happy with just telling stories about Roger to everybody. And, you know, he's like, yeah, Shanks showed up about 10 years ago. He told me about you, Luffy. He told me he gave you his straw hat. So I've always wanted to meet you. And he just kind of pops back, a you know, a bottle of tequila or whatever. And he's like, let me tell you some stories about Roger. And he tells the tale about how Roger wasn't captured by the Marines. He turned himself in because Roger was a baller. And he was like, I've already conquered the seas. I already found the greatest treasure ever. And you guys can't do diddly dick about it. I'm the king of the pirates. Here you go. Put the cuffs on me. I'm going to die anyway in like six months. I don't even care at this point. It's a beautiful scene from top to bottom. It's even more well done in the anime because they add this really interesting soundtrack in the background. It was actually used in one of the movies. I think the Cursed Sword uh, movie it was used in. But it's a soundtrack you don't usually hear in One Piece. And it's this really beautiful scene where Rayleigh's just sitting at, you know, Shockey's bar. But he's remembering Roger. And Roger's kind of next to him. And they just kind of walk away from each other. And Rayleigh's telling the story about how when Roger disbanded the pirate crew, everybody kind of went their separate ways even i know i don't know where everyone is um he mentioned buggies like maybe you know about buggy he's a pirate in the east obviously shanks is a yonko but when it comes to most of the crew i don't really know where they ended up in fact i think the strats even tell him about crocus and he's like oh yeah crocus is that where he is okay that's cool you know so even rayleigh doesn't know where most of them are right um now, there is a limit to what Rayleigh is willing to tell them all. Uh, he doesn't want to tell Luffy anything that, you know, Shanks is up to that he maybe he doesn't want to know about at this point because, you know, he understands Rayleigh is a pirate through and through, right? So he understands that the journey is much of the adventure. So he's not going to sit Luffy down and tell him, you know, Luffy, here's what to expect in the new world. Now, because he understands, like, if Luffy's a true pirate, if he's like Roger's true successor, then he's going to want to do this on his own. All right, and it, it, it culminates in this really cool scene where Usopp decides to finally stand up and be like, Guys, we have the first mate of Roger's crew right here! Where's the One Piece? Just tell us! It's just, we can make this done, like, now! And uh, Usopp stands up and shouts over, you know, and then Rayleigh. Rayleigh doesn't even say anything. Rayleigh just kind of is sitting there drinking, and he just kind of smirks because... He knows what's going to happen. Luffy cuts off Usopp, and Luffy goes on that whole thing where he's like, I don't want to go on an adventure that's not fun, Usopp. Shut up. We're not hearing a damn word out of, out of his mouth. I don't even care if there is a treasure. I don't care if we get to Raftal and there's nothing there. It's, it's the journey that's part of this, and I'm not going to have it ruined. I'm not going to go on an adventure that's not fun. And then Rayleigh's just there like, damn straight, son damn straight but then you get to the scene with robin that's i think even more interesting in that sense although the thing with usopp i i find that usopp should have shut up about the one piece but he could have been like all oh, right i'm sorry uh i'm not gonna talk about the one piece anymore uh really um did you hear about an island of giants you know i would have loved usopp to ask him about elbaf you know like okay well luffy that's your adventure you don't okay i won't spoil that for you no spoilers luffy but this is my adventure i want to go to elbaf Rayleigh, could you tell me about elbaf and Rayleigh's like oh yeah there's an island in the new world it's full of giants you'll love it it's crazy um so that would have been cool if he asked him about that but it's fine but then you get to the scene with Rayleigh and robin now the thing is with luffy he wants to go on his adventure, find the One Piece, and that's like the end goal, okay? But the adventure is part of it. Robin's, you know, her whole dream is to discover the Void Century. What happened during that blank period that the government blotted out? Like, what were the people, what were the scholars of O'Hara killed for, basically, okay? Now... This is an adventure in its own right because you have to go and collect all the different Rioponoglyphs. There's nine of them, and then you put them all together and you figure out the, the true history of the world. That's fine, but at the end of the day, it's just knowledge. So it can be passed on by word of mouth if somebody knows about it. 
Rayleigh and Roger's crew, they know about it. So that was a really, I think, even more of an impactful scene for me, rather than Usopp shouting, like, tell us what the One Piece is! It's at the end of all this, they're sitting in a bar, and Robin's like, I gotta ask him. And so she stands up, and she's just like, do you know what happened during the Void Century? And Rayleigh's like, oh yeah, we found out everything. And I can tell you right here and now if you want me to, miss. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that having dangled in front of you at that point. Like, this is Robin's whole... This is, this is her whole dream, her whole story. Everybody she ever cared about was wiped out. Her island was burned to the ground because of this. And her whole life, it's like, I gotta figure out what this is. And it's right here in front of her. All right? And Rayleigh, he's perfectly content with telling her, but he does give her a warning. He says this. He says, I can tell you right here and now everything we learned about the Void Century, but there's two things here. Number one, you're not going to be able to change a damn thing about this the same way that we're not going to be able to change it. Now, I don't know if he was referring to the fact that, you know, it already happened 900 years ago, there's nothing you can do about this now, it's in the past, okay? Can't change that. Or if he was referring to it as, even if there is something that you could do, it's too far gone and you can't do anything about it. I don't know which way you want to take that. But the second thing Rayleigh brings up, he says, it's probably best for you to learn about it on your own and then come to your own conclusions. He's kind of vague with it, but he implies that like, not everybody that reads the Rio Poneglyph and figures out the Void Century would arrive at the exact same conclusion. All right? Because Rayleigh says, if when you find out what happened back then, you might arrive at a completely different conclusion than we did. And then Robin also goes on to ask him about, like, how did Roger know about the Poneglyph writing and Skypea? And Rayleigh's like, no, he just had, he wasn't a scholar. He just, you know, could hear the voices of all things. And that's how he was able to write in that language. He didn't actually know about it. Also, Odin was with them as well. So maybe he had a part in this as, as well. But yeah, he's just like, yeah, the, you know, uh, we, we weren't scholars or anything. We don't know about this. So... Oda does it in a really cool way, whereas he has the characters behave in a way that they would act. Usopp, the way he is, really would ask about the One Piece. Robin, you know, she's a scholar and everything. She really would do like, well, the answer might be right here. So he does it in a way where he touches upon these big world-ending events of One Piece. You know, what the One Piece is, what the Void Century is. But he obviously can't reveal everything right then and there. But he has it like, okay, here is a representative from the old era, the old guard, Silver's Rayleigh, okay? In a lot of ways, he is what the Straw Hats aspire to be in one way or another, okay? So that's what he really represents as his character as a whole, right? But beyond that, he's also responsible for saving the Straw Hats bacon, not once, not twice, but three times! Three times in this series, the Straw Hats probably would have been just a bunch of quivering cubes of bloody jelly on the ground if it wasn't for this magnificent man right here. The first time is he saves them during the battle with uh, the Pacifista, Centomaro, and Kizaru. Because Kizaru shows up out of nowhere, and the Straw Hats would have just been devastated at that point. There's no way that they could barely take down one Pacifista that was a prototype. And then you'll send Tomorrow and the other Pacifistas, they were giving them problems as well. Um, you know, probably wouldn't even be able to get out of that, you know, because they already were winded from fighting one Pacifista, then they have to fight another one, plus this sumo wrestler dude. So they're already in a tough spot, but then Kizaru showed up. Hell, all Kizaru had to do was just zip into the sky and be like, zip, 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 laser beam, laser beam, laser beam. Okay, let's all bring him in. But then Rayleigh showed up and then pff, kicks freaking Kizaru and then he pulls out his sword. He's like, let's do this. And then one-on-one -on -one sword fighting with an admiral. So he saved their asses there. The second time is after the war, he swims through the combat, slices a Sea King down in the process, and then stops Luffy from going back, 
Because the whole thing there was if Luffy went back to Saba Odi and got his group back together then and went into the New World, um, they would have been devastated. Yeah, they wouldn't be nearly strong enough to deal with that. I did a whole what if scenario on that. They would have they, their journey would have ended a lot quicker. Um, so we kind of saved their lives there. And then the third thing is he actually personally trains Luffy over the next two years on Ruse Skyna, or the next year and a half. And it was because of that training that Luffy learned all about hockey, and he perfected Gear 4, and he, you know, learned um, the secrets of observation from Rayleigh, what he just is, is beginning to understand from his fight with Katakuri, seeing the future a little bit. And so if it wasn't for that training, like, for example, if Rayleigh just stopped Luffy from going back to Saba Odi, and then Luffy just trained on his own for two years, wouldn't be nearly as strong. Oh, and I guess there's also a fourth time that he save them but not really it was it was when they get back to Saba Odi and the marines were chasing after him and Rayleigh just takes out his sword and then just draws a line in the dirt and he's like my pupil is setting off now you guys can uh follow him if you want but you're gonna have to cross that line and I would I would highly recommend you do not I love it because everybody knows about Rayleigh even the marines know where he is Okay, and, and they even bring this up to Garp at one point. Like, one low-ranking Marine goes up to Garp, and they're like, Garp, son! The, the Rayleigh, Dark King, Roger crew, we know right where he is! And Garp is just kind of chill about it. He's just like, oh yeah, we hear reports about that guy all the time. Like, that's one thing you gotta wonder. Like, how can Rayleigh lay low for so long? The answer is he didn't. The Marines know he, where he is. They know he's living on Sab Odi. They, they can march right up to Shockey's bar and knock on the door, you know? They know he's there. But it would just be too much of a trouble to bring him in, you know? Uh, especially since during the war and everything, they were worried about Marineford and Whitebeard or everything. It's like, we cannot, we can't split our forces right now. Because he was able to go one-on-one -on -one against Kizaru. By the way, Kizaru is pretty much in his prime right now. Rayleigh's pushing 80 years old. All right, and he even kind of brings up every now and then as the old badass character. He was like, oh man, if only I was in my prime, I might be able to. But for right now, this is all I can do is fend off just one measly admiral that can travel at the speed of light. That's all I can manage right now. Man, I'm getting old. But yeah, so they know right where he is, but it would take a freaking just <laughs> armada of marine soldiers. They would have to bring at least more than one admiral even if you bring one admiral that might not be enough you'd have to bring at least two together to make this possible um and the island would probably be absolutely devastated also you got to keep in mind shockey's there i don't know if the marines know about her too much but shockey has connection to the rocks crew possibly might even be rocks themselves i don't know so that's like another thing that if the marines didn't know about that and they rolled up and they saw shockey they would just be like, okay, I'm sorry, we didn't know you two were together, we're just gonna be leaving now. Now, you know what, it, it might be at this point you might be thinking I'm overhyping this, so let's actually talk about this, okay? If the Marines one day actually decided, you know what, we're doing it, we're taking in Rayleigh once and for all, what would they actually have to do to accomplish that, or at least have a good chance of accomplishing that, okay? If they decided to put everything in the New World on hold, it's like, oh, no, we don't care about Big Mom, we don't care about Kaido, we're bringing in Rayleigh. We're pulling all of our forces to going after Rayleigh. They wouldn't do it, but let's say, let's just, you know, hypothetically, they would. Okay. I do feel like they would have to bring more than one Admiral, because Rayleigh was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with one Admiral pretty damn evenly there. Uh, who knows who would have won that fight at the end? I'm gonna say it would be Rayleigh. But it's like, okay, you gotta bring at least one Admiral, so bring Kizaru. Also, it'd probably be a good idea to bring Sakazuki. It would be a good idea for the Fleet Admiral to be there, not just because of the power he has, but also for morale. Because if you go up to a bunch of Marine soldiers, even if they were veterans, even if you went up to a bunch of Marine captains and Vice Admirals, and you were like, today, men, we're going after the Dark King. Even, like, 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 Smoker, who's a Vice Admiral, they, he gives them the marching orders, like, Sengoku's up, not Sengoku, uh, Sakazuki's up there, like, we're going after the Dark King. Even, like, Smoker would be like, oh, what's that goosebump I just got? Even, like, the Vice Admirals would be like, oh, boy. Oh, they look around like, oh, half of these people are not going to be here by sundown, are they? <laughs> you know? Um, th it would be, it would be pretty rough, but if you bring Kizaru... And uh, Sakazuki, who's the fleet admiral, 
all the vice admirals, Garp included, plus all the riffraff soldiers and everything, and you march complete. Like, you would have to have, like, a perimeter around Sabaody. So maybe, like, the riffraff soldiers, and they get a bunch of the captains and the commodores. They completely surround the archipelago with uh, battleships. And, and then you have just one way in or out, and then that's when the fleet admiral ship shows up, and then you get Akainu walking down, followed by Kizaru, followed by all these vice admirals, and uh, then they see Rayleigh and Shaki, and they're like, your number's up, we're doing this. Um, we don't know a lot about Shaki, but if it would be just Rayleigh under those circumstances, that would be probably a good chance of Rayleigh being taken in or going down. Wouldn't it be funny if they go through all of that mess and then Rayleigh doesn't even put up a fight? Rayleigh just kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, you did all this for me expecting some epic battle. It's cool. I could chill out and impel down for a little while. It's like, no, you're going to be executed. I'm like... Sure I am. You know, you know whatever. Um, I don't, yeah, in that situation, Rayleigh's a smart guy. He might be like, wow, you guys really put all of this, like there's Yonko in the New World and you're putting all of that on hold just for a little old me? Huh. All right, well, you know, just, just take me in. <laughs> that would be funny as hell. Uh, in that situation, Sakazuki might be like, oh, nope, 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 we're not doing this again. We're fighting you, I don't care. <laughs> we pulled all of this together. Oh, but yeah, okay. Right, so now let's talk a little bit about uh, some history involving Rayleigh, his backstory. Well, of course, just like Roger, there's swaths of it we do not know about, but his journey as a pirate began as sort of like a chance encounter with Roger. Uh, it might have even been in the East Blue, because we see a flashback of Roger at the youngest we've ever seen him, and Rayleigh, he's obscured, he's just chilling out on some random boat, just drinking some booze. And then Rayleigh, I mean, uh, Roger walks up to him and he's like, Oh, that's a nice boat you got there! What's your name, matey? Mm. He's just like, Rayleigh? And he's like, ah, oh, Rayleigh, come and journey with me. We'll take the seas by storm. And Rayleigh's like, are you drunk, dude? Because I just met you, you know? But eventually they go on their adventure. I don't know how Roger convinced him to do it. Probably a story there in and of itself. And uh, yes, eventually they, they built the strongest pirate crew that ever did sail the seven or possibly nine seas of One Piece. Um, yeah, now that's a great scene. I love that. Because it's just one of those things, and, and, and Rayleigh has a little bit of a monologue about it involving fate. He's like, I've never really believed in fate before, but you looking back on it now and all the stuff that happened, maybe things don't just happen by chance, you know? And he's, he starts crying, and he's like looking out to sea after the Straw Hat set sail for Fishman Island, and Shockey's there, and he has this line which is like, I just, I want to see a new king before I die. And that is probably the single most beautiful scene with Rayleigh ever, you know, where he's looking on to the new generation. He realizes, you know, I've done everything I could to try to pass the torch. I am certain it's going to be Luffy. I know if Roger was here right now, he would definitely approve of Luffy carrying on this legacy and finding the One Piece. Um, you know, he it's such a crazy thing that I was able to meet somebody that embodies Roger's spirit again in my old age. And I'm glad I got to know him and I'm glad I got to train him for all those for like over a year. Um, I've done everything I can do now. He has to finish this himself and I hope he does it before I die. And I know he will. And that, that's, that's a great scene involving Rayleigh there. We know some more uh, backstory about him while he was on the crew. Um, this is one of the things that Oda set up way back in the early days of One Piece where he introduced Buggy. Oda already knew at that point that Shanks and Buggy were going to be crewmates, uh, apprentice pirates on Roger's crew. He even incorporates Rayleigh into one of the early chapters and episodes of One Piece and even made a point to mention to the anime staff. And he's like, when you guys animate this scene, make sure that they do not call this man a captain because he's not he's just a high-ranking officer he kept it ambiguous i'm sure he probably had a name in mind but he's like he kept it ambiguous it's the same basic design he's got the glasses he's got the interesting like segmented beard hair didn't have the scar yet um but that is it's very clearly rayleigh it's you look at this guy and it's like yeah it's a little bit rough it's the early days of the anime in the manga it looks a lot more like what he does now but yeah back then yeah you could you could tell that this is definitely rayleigh with the design so oda knew about this way back then what he was going to do with the character um 
of course, after Rayleigh is properly introduced, kind of the floodgates open and we get those scenes, like the scene during Strong World. That was another big one. Rayleigh was revealed right around the time that Strong World was, you know, getting made. And then we find out the history involving Shiki and the Battle of Ed War and Rogers there. And you see Rayleigh in the background, much younger, of course. Um, so, yeah, there's scenes like that. Now, Rayleigh, in terms of power, uh, does not have a devil fruit. We know this because the dude swam straight through the comm belt and sliced a Sea King in half. He didn't even act like it was a big deal. You know, he didn't like just get out of the water and be like, Ha! I have slayed the Sea Leviathan! Hey guys, what's up? No, he literally just comes out of the water and is like, Oh, well, okay, well, my clothes are wet, my ship got destroyed, oh, what? oh hey guys, what's up? And he's like, they're just like the, the law the law's crew they're just flabbergasted they're like um did you just swim through the freaking com belt and it's like yep did you just kill that sea king yep oh okay then <laughs> you know even if they're like allies you know penguin and sachi are like we need to go rethink our, our our life choices, and we might be worshiping you as our as our new god. And Rayleigh's like, yeah, I get that all the time. It's cool, because <laughs> you, know? um, you know, muscular old man just comes out of the water like, yep, yeah, this is just a normal day for Silver's Dark King Rayleigh. Um, but yeah, he doesn't have a devil fruit power, you know, so that's just how he is. All he needs, dude, he needs just needs a sword sword and maybe some hockey if he feels like it you know honestly he could probably you know that scene during punk hazard when zoro cut down monet but zoro did not use hockey to do it he just like sliced her in half and it was just because he did it so fast and it was so powerful and monet didn't see it coming even though it didn't actually physically hurt her it mentally just jacked her up and was like oh, it's, it's so strong Rayleigh could do that with pretty much anybody, you know, barring probably some of the strongest characters like the Admirals or the Yonko. Rayleigh could just do that. He could walk straight up to somebody. I would say even somebody as like skilled as Crocodile, you know, Rayleigh could do that same trick where he just like without even using hockey just intimidates the hell out of Crocodile. And he would just have this move where he just moves behind Crocodile and shing and crocodile just gets like sliced into like mincemeat and of course he's made of sand it wouldn't actually hurt him but crocodile uh, you know because that like rayleigh's on a whole other level at this point you know where i i i am fairly confident that if the fight between rayleigh and kizaru would have continued rayleigh would have won that fight and of course this is not even talking about what if he was in his prime Rayleigh in his prime versus Kizaru in his prime, which is basically right now, um, Rayleigh would win, you know, it's pretty obvious that he would have won, actually, most definitely there. So it's like he's in a completely different class, you know, where you can't even really touch him unless you're, like, high-level Admiral or Yonko level. Beyond that, don't even bother. You know, his Conqueror's Hockey alone is so freak show strong. It it wasn't able to take out people. That Like, there were a few people in the auction house that were able to resist it, sure. Um, but you have to also figure with that, Rayleigh is a master of Conqueror's, right? So, he's probably not going to go overkill with it, right? He probably walked out in the auction house, he saw a bunch of random, you know, guards and riffraff, and he's like, alright, a little bit of a dose of Conquerors is probably enough. Like, if, you, let me, let me put it another way, like, to just talk about varying levels of Conquerors hockey, okay? If Rayleigh was in a serious fight where the opponent he was facing off against was, like, a serious threat, like, if it was Rayleigh versus Kaido, oh god... Oh, Rayleigh versus Kaido. <laughs> oh, someone needs to make a fanfic of that with pictures. But now, if it was like Rayleigh versus Kaido and it was a balls out fight, you know, do you think the Conqueror's Hockey that would be coming off of Rayleigh in that situation would be the same level of Conqueror's Hockey that he admitted at the auction house? I don't think so. Rayleigh walked out of the auction house. He's just like, all right, whatever. Boom. He's, all right. Oh, a few of you managed to stand back up. That's cool. Like, could Ray, like, because I think even Penguin and Sachi on Law's crew were able to resist it. Do you think Rayleigh could have knocked out Penguin and Sachi with his Conqueror's Hockey if he really wanted to? The answer is yes, he could have. Maybe even Law and Kid, if he really was pissed off and he really wanted to. Um, 
But I mean, it's a little bit more ambiguous for those guys. But for Penguin and Sachi, they definitely could have. He definitely could have. Um, so yeah. Uh, beyond that, Armament and Observation. His Observation, uh, he was pretty much, he stated when he was training Luffy. Like, yeah, you get to a certain point with Observation, you can see into the future. Now, the way he said that was like, oh, there's, there's a few other strong people in the world that can do that. But I think by extension, he could do it too. You know, like, why, like, he knows about this thing firsthand, so it's like, yeah, I can do that too. I can see a little bit into the future, but the purpose of that was training Luffy, um, you know, so maybe he's like, yeah, okay, let's start off slow at first and then work our way up, but I'm sure he could definitely do that. His armament is the stuff of gods, just because he was able to clash with Kizaru. Kizaru is made of light, using a light sword, and, you know, Rayleigh could just walk into the fight and just clash, and then just, you know keep it up with him without any serious, uh, you know, uh, handicaps or anything. The only handicap being that he's sort of old now and he's lost some of his youthful vigor, but, you know, it, it, it's not even that big of a handicap when you could still go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a damn admiral, you know what I mean? Oh, and also, how could I forget this? This is, this is probably the most epic part of Rayleigh's character, all right? Now, we've talked about a lot of cool stuff up to this point. You know, um, his hockey, his swimming ability, slicing down a sea king, intimidating a bunch of marines, like they're a bunch of school children, all that crap. The most epic thing about Rayleigh, though, he gets to bang Shocky. Yep. And you look at Shocky, and you know she's like in her mid-60s, but she don't look it. <laughs> Shocky, you know what? I'm picturing the backstory with Rayleigh and Shocky. Because Shocky was definitely part of the Rocks crew at some point. She might have even been the actual character of Rocks, but that's way, way more speculation at this point. But she was definitely part of that crew. This was, by the way, the same crew that uh, Whitebeard and Kaido and Big Mom and uh, Miss Bocking were on at some point. Miss Bocking is really not all that impressive, but who knows? She might have been a really strong pirate back in the day. Who knows? Um... But she was part of that crew. I could imagine Roger's crew clashing with Rox's crew. And like, you know, Rayleigh going out and, and you know, clashing with uh, Shockey. However Shockey fought, we still don't know how that worked. I'm imagining her in a sort of dominatrix outfit using a whip. Sort of like Sadie from Impel Down, but like way hotter and way more badass. I imagine Rayleigh clashing with Shockey and they're kind of like flirting while they're fighting with each other. Like they're seriously fighting to the death here. But they're like, oh, you're kind of cute. You know, it's like, oh, your beard's pretty, pretty damn hot there, Rayleigh. And they're just kind of clashing. And then after, you know, after rocks, the pirates disbanded, after the after Roger turned himself in, after the journey kind of died down, they sort of found each other again after that. And they just like, yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. <laughs> and they just started living together. Um, in the data book, I think it's Blue Deep. Um, it's referred to as, uh, like, person of my household. That's how, like, Shockey refers to Rayleigh and vice versa. Like, it's the Japanese term for person of my household. It's a term that's really only used with married couples. All right. Either that or people that are so close to each other, they might as well be married couples, something like that. So that's the basic relationship that Rayleigh and Shockey have with each other. All right. So at the end of the day, Rayleigh wins. I don't get Rayleigh wins at the end of the day. You know, Marines can't freaking touch him. He's so ungodly strong. You know, he was part of the strongest crew, and he just gets to spend his retirement years chilling out on Sabaody, gambling, and just drinking, and just having a good old-fashioned time. That's his retirement. The only sad thing about this whole thing is I don't think we're going to get to see a lot of Rayleigh anytime soon. You know, we had the badass moments at the turn of the series, you know, right around the time skip. We got to see what Rayleigh was capable of and everything. Sort of like the higher levels that the Straw Hats are, are vaunting for, you know. Like, if you keep training hard, you might eventually reach my level someday. Uh, but now, after that's over, I mean, we'll probably, we might cut back to Rayleigh and Shockey every now and then, you know, chilling out at the bar and reading the paper, finding out about the exploits and of the Straw Hat crew and everything. We'll, we'll, uh, you know, you know, po poke in on and see what they're doing every now and then. But for the most part, uh, Rayleigh is more just a spectator. But that's okay. That's what he wants to be. Rayleigh doesn't want to be in the action. Rayleigh doesn't want to be like, you know what, Shockey? Dust off the old pirate ship. We're going out to sea. That's not Rayleigh's thing. He's in retirement. He just wants to live kind of a uh, peaceful life as much as possible, given that he is, you know, the Dark King. 
I wonder how he got his epithet, by the way. Many people have thrown out that he's called the Dark King because of his armament hockey, right? So he could, like, coat his entire sword in, in the, the uh, vulcanization, the blackness, and then maybe he could do something like Virgo did, you know, hockeying up his whole body, but unlike Virgo, he would actually be a badass in doing that, and that's how he got the epithet. Like, he comes in out of nowhere swinging a pitch black sword and just, shing! Doesn't just slice one galleon in half like Mihawk. He slices like ten, like just slice them just like that. That's how you would probably get that epithet. And also, he's the right hand of the pirate king. So he's like, are we gonna call him the Dark Prince? No, he's the king. Damn it. Um, we still need to know how he got his scar. We don't know about that. We don't know how he got his scar. He also has another one on his chest. We don't know about the origins of that either. So, uh, might have been something right. Hey, maybe Shocky caused one of the scars. Maybe it's like she scarred him at one point, and then there's a scar on her body that Rayleigh caused, and it's like a mutual kind of like, you're a, you're a, you're a true warrior. Let's bone. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. I'll dial that back a bit there. It's like, does te Teching, do you have a thing for Shocky? You know, she's like 60s. Hey, 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 she's hot. I'm sorry. I'm saying it. Okay, look at her compared to Big Mom. They're like almost the same damn age. Damn, just damn. Oh, man. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's most likely how he got the epithet there, uh, which, if that's the case, if he got the epithet because of his armament hockey, that might have alluded to his armament hockey being his his specialty, you know? Like, he, he was able to awaken conquerors um, and observation he can see into the future, but maybe the thing he's absolutely best at, like, dominating at, is his armament hockey, and that's why he got the title. Uh, I think that's a fair way of looking at it there. Also, because Rayleigh ended up getting Conquerors, and he was only the he was the first mate of the crew, he was the second in command. That led people to think like Zoro. You know, Zoro's got a scar on his eye too, and he's the first mate, and he's a swordsman. I think Zoro can get Conquerors too. And I I admit, for a long time, I didn't think he was going to. I've I I've sort of softened on it a little bit. I don't know. The, Oda might do a kind of thing with that where it's like whenever Zoro opens up his, his eye, if he can open up his eye, maybe it'll reveal like hidden Conqueror's hockey the whole time or something like that. I, I don't know how it's going to work there. Uh, you can leave your comments below on how you feel about Zoro receiving Conquerors. I mean, if it was the same basic dynamic as Roger and... and um, uh, Rayleigh as Luffy and Zoro, I could see that. Um, although, then again, Oda might want to do it differently. Oda might want to be like, let's not have it exactly the same. You know, because we're probably going to find out stuff about Roger and uh, Rayleigh and, the, and their whole crew. Like, maybe when they arrived at Raftul, something that they did, you know, Luffy and the crew are going to do differently. You know, he might do that. Like, not only, like, you're not just following in Roger's footsteps, you're going beyond what he did. Or you're carrying on his spirit, but you're doing things your own way. Something to that effect. Something to that nature. I would be fine with. But, uh, okay. Well, I think we did a pretty damn good job of talking about how badass this old man is right here. I hope he does show up in the story. I hope at some point we do get a badass fight with him. I really hope they don't do the trope, though, where it's like the wise old sage mentor, you know, who's badass in all these different varieties of ways, ends up getting capped off by somebody. I hope we don't do that, but... Rayleigh's just still chilling out on Sabaoni. I think near the end of the story, he will leave the archipelago and he will go and into the new world and maybe he'll find Luffy there or something to congratulate him or something. But I don't know. That's still a long way out. But for right now, Rayleigh's cool, chilling out on Sabaoni like a baller. Um, you guys have a great day. I'm going to talk about Roger tomorrow, I think. That's something that's been coming for a long time, a solid Goldie Roger discussion video. So get ready for that. Um... Then we're going to talk about Rob Lucci, who's, okay, not as epic, but still a character I've been wanting to talk about for a while. Haven't made a discussion video about them yet. And then, ending it out, I think on Thursday, yeah, we're going to end this out with the most badass female in the entire series. You think it's Robin? I love Robin. I love me some Robin. And she is best girl, but, you know, when you're talking about badass female characters, I mean, you got to throw in Rebecca. She uses a sword. Does Robin use a sword? Does Nami use a sword? Well, she had the air sword, that one. That doesn't count. Does, uh, does Katarina Davon even use a sword? No. Rebecca uses a sword by default. Rayleigh needs to train her up. Damn straight. All right. Have a good one, ladies and gentlemen. Teching signing out.